Okay, let's do this. <laughs> so, there was a, a recent update. <laughs> Is it fair to say? Um, I just updated the website. If you refresh, we have the document for lab this week. Uh, so if you want to take a look at that before lab. Lab is all about getting you ready for next week's quiz. We have our first learning objective verification quiz and interview next week. So just a reminder, next week's lab, you'll sit down, you'll get to lab, you'll get three Scala programs that you'll have to draw out the memory diagrams for. I know we haven't done a ton of memory diagrams yet, uh, but lab this week is all about memory diagrams. And also the next two lectures, Wednesday and Friday, all about memory diagrams. So we'll get you in a, a good bit of practice before we get into them. Uh, so far, we only have that one example in lecture. Uh, for lab this week, the, it's effectively a sample quiz. Uh, your actual quiz will be very similar to this. We have three programs where you're going to draw the memory diagrams for them. Uh, that'll be what your quiz is next week. You sit down in lab next week. TAs are going to somehow disseminate three programs to you, the code for three programs. You sit down on paper, sketch out the memory diagrams for those three programs, and they'll look similar to these three. Uh, so there's no, we're not pulling any punches. Like, this is what you're going to see next week, something very similar to this. Lab next week, you'll have time to practice these, and then the TAs are going to go over the solutions to these three sample programs so they have a good idea what's going on. Please ask them lots of questions. Goodness gracious. Uh, ask them lots of questions. It's, uh, this lab this week is made so that if you're paying attention and seeing what's going on this week, that next week you should be set up for success on that quiz. You're ready to draw these memory diagrams and uh, earn your learning objective read portion for LO1 and hopefully also that application objective on that quiz. Clean all that up now. All right, so let's get into I just got a little bit of slides. Today's gonna be a lot of uh, gonna be a lot of IntelliJ, just going through some examples. Uh, I, I'm actually gonna go through different examples than I allude to in the slides. There's the is anagrams and find anagrams examples in the slides. Uh, Paul did at least go over the is anagrams in his lecture. So if you do want to see that specific example, you can check out his lectures. I'm going to do two uh, slightly different examples um, for, uh, for my examples in these, this lecture. So let me go through these like four slides, and then we'll go to some IntelliJ. Let's get some lighting going on here. Talk about unit testing. Doubles, never, ever, ever use equal, equal to compare two doubles. Hopefully everybody's getting this by now. Uh, your task two expected deadline is Wednesday morning before you'll see me again. So this is my last chance to tell you, don't use equal, equal. Use equal, equal on your task two tests. And the uh, big objective of task two is writing the test. The code isn't too much more difficult than, uh, than objective one, possibly about the same difficulty. Uh, depending on how you look at it. But it's all about writing tests. This is your first time writing unit tests. When you write those unit tests, this method returns a double. If you're saying, does this double equal equal the double that I expect, you're going to be wrong. It's going to pass your tests on your code. That's going to pass your code most likely because you're probably computing things the same way you did in your code as in your tests. But when you submit to Autolab, if you're doing this, you're almost certainly going to get failed a correct solution will be the feedback you see. So if you are seeing that and you're trying to figure out what's going on, just remember me saying never use equal equal to compare doubles for equality. You have to allow some sort of tolerance. It doesn't have to be th this many zeros. You can play around with what epsilon should be. It should be large enough to allow for truncation errors to still be accepted, but it should be small enough that it's not going to interfere with the logic of your program. So we don't want like an epsilon being 100, uh, for example, because then our solutions can be off by 100 and still be accepted. Uh, we just want enough to be able to eliminate those truncation errors. Truncation errors are going to be like out to here with zeros. We just want to make sure we get rid of those and consider anything that's equivalent within a truncation error to be accepted. 
If you draw all three memory diagrams correctly on the quiz with completely flawless, with no mistakes, I can guarantee you're going to get the application objective and the learning objective. Uh, if you make some mistakes, you're probably, uh, some small mistakes that don't reflect a complete misunderstanding or misunderstanding of the memory diagrams of how stack memory works, you're probably still going to get the AO. Uh, but once you start making mistakes that are, uh, you know, like bigger mistakes, legit mistakes, uh, that show some misunderstanding, that's when you're going to not get the AO, the application objective. If you make enough mistakes where it's like, wow, this student just doesn't know what's going on with these, we need them to take this quiz again, uh, study some more, and show us how the stack works, uh, that's, when, uh, that's when you're not going to get the LO. We're going to make you do the, that sounds bad wording it like that. Uh, that's when you're going to have to take that remake to get the LO, the learning objective. Uh, if you look at the sample quiz, it's the way we look at this, the way Paul and I are looking at it is uh, programs one and two are pretty straightforward. Uh, those ones should be well within your grasp if you've been paying attention to lectures. Even just the one lecture, uh, the one uh, memory diagram example I did, as long as you paid attention to that, you should be pretty good with that. Maybe you'll need to, to study more and just get some more practice with it. But one and two are well within reach. Uh, that's where you're getting your LO. And then question three is a bit more complex, a bit of moving parts. There are three method calls, three stack frames that go on the stack. There's a loop. You know, there's a lot going on. There's a method that's called for side effects that returns unit. There are methods that have return values. Uh, there's a, a lot of moving pieces. If you get everything there, that's where you're earning your application objective. So if you're good on the first two, you're probably good, loosely speaking, you're probably good for the LO. If you're good on uh, program three, you're probably good for the AO. Uh, and of course, these are manually graded by humans. Like we're going to make judgment calls on each one. Did this student display that they can trace through the stack? That's the LO. Did they really, do they really internalize this and they completely understand it? That's the AO. That's roughly what we're looking at. So where the thresholds are is uh, based on how well you're displaying your understanding. <coughs> so testing doubles, never use equal equal. Get your task two done before that uh, expected deadline. Y'all did really well with task one. Uh, a large portion of the class got the expected deadline for task one. I, I love seeing that. I wanna see you all get that for task two as well and all semester. I'd love to see you all do really well. So task two by Wednesday, make sure you're using this to compare your doubles. This is the big thing that we're trying to get you to do for task two. If you're doing that, you should be pretty good on task two. Yes? What if you use equal equal and it comes out correct when you submit to autolab yeah. that means i did something wrong in my grader <laughs> so if you got away with this and autolab gave you credit yeah that's something i uh i don't have good enough uh testing uh and you got away with it you know i'm not going to take that away from you if autolab <laughs> said you're good then you're good um but it's something i'll have to update for next semester and make sure there's no loopholes Um, but this is what you're, if, if my grader's doing what it's supposed to be doing, that's what you should need. For testing maps. So now we're starting the, to think about task three. Task three, the first method you write returns a map. The second method you write returns a list. And by the way, after today, I'm going to cover everything you need for task three as well. So the next two lectures, it's just reinforcing everything we've learned and talking about the memory diagrams to get you ready for that quiz next week. I'm going to shift gears to focus on that quiz and just reinforce everything. Today's the last day of LO1 like content. I'm not going to cover any new content or concepts Wednesday and Friday. Review and prepping you for that quiz. Uh, I guess, I mean, I guess I didn't do much for memory diagrams. I haven't even put anything on the heap yet, so that'll be new concept. Uh, uh, technically, but this is the last concept for the project. Let me say it that way. That one's absolutely true. So testing maps, the first method you write for task three returns a map, mapping city names to populations. How do we test two maps for equality? So when we test two maps, when we have a return value, we call that method, we get a map back, and we have a map that we expect. We expect some map of city names to their populations that we're expecting. How are we going to compare those two to make sure that they are equal? 
These are much more complex than doubles. There's probably a lot we have to do uh, to compare these maps to make sure they're right. Nope, we just hit it with an equal equal and we're done. We just say these two maps equal equal each other. And if they have all the same key value pairs, we're good. And that's it. Maps are actually really easy to compare in Scala. Assuming the values are not doubles, which we're not going to throw that at you in this semester, because it's just kind of tedious. You just got to loop over and call compare doubles on them all. Uh, it's just tedious. So for maps, you actually just call equal equal. If we have these two maps, they're the same key value pairs. I added them to the map in different order. But remember, in a key value store, order doesn't even matter. There's no actual order to a key value pair. There's, it's not a sequential data structure where we have all these values in a particular order, at particular indices or anything. We got none of that. It's just these values are stored at these keys. So when you check if these two maps are equal equal to each other, what Scala is going to do is check if they have all of the same keys, and they do in any order. One, two, three, one, two, three, we're good. And then Scala is going to check for each key do both of the keys in each of the maps map to the same value? One maps to 15, one maps to 15, good. Two maps to 20, two maps to 20, good. Three maps to 25, three maps to 25, good. This resolves to true, and our assert passes. So maps, really not much to it. We just hit it with equal, equal. Uh, if anyone's uh, has Java experience, you know, uh, with strings and a lot of other data structures, uh, you would never do equal equal, you would do dot equals. If I'm talking to you, if that resonates with you, uh, equal equal in Scala actually calls the equals method. So equal equal in Scala is the same as saying dot equals. We don't have that same concern that Java had. If you don't have Java experience, just ignore what I just said. Equal equal, that's going to get us where we want to be. So comparing maps, pretty simple. We actually do just throw equal equal at it. No worries. Uh, but again, if it were like a map of int to double, then you do have that truncation error, and that is a bit more complex. But we're not going to throw that at you because that's just mean. You've got to write a loop and manually iterate over the keys. Eh, that's not. It's just tedious and it doesn't test a new concept. That could be like a, a 115 style question, maybe. No, we don't. Well, never mind. Uh, testing lists, there actually is a little bit more that we have to do when we test lists. And this is where the end of task three, those of you who have started have had this question quite a bit. Here's your answer. How do we test these lists in above average cities? Above average city is going to return a list of all the cities with above average population for a particular country. But when we're comparing two lists, we want to say, I expect this list of cities to be returned. And we call the method, and it's going to return a list of cities. We, what we care about is if that returned list of cities contains the same cities, regardless of order. But Scala is going to check the order. This is a sequential data structure. The list 1, 2, 3 is a different list than the list 2, 3, 1. Those are different values because they're in different order. So if you just throw equal, equal at this, that's going to fail. They're not the same list because even though they have the same values, they're in different order. So if you have your expected list of cities that you're returning from above average cities, and then you call the method and it returns the same cities but in different order, and you're just hitting it with equal, equal in your assert, it's going to fail. It's going to fail that test even though it returned the correct answer. So we need to be able to accept any order here. And usually this will be similar to, uh, similar to test two testing. What you're going to do is, what most students do, is this fails when you put your expected list of cities. And then you just either change your code or change your expected list <laughs> to make sure that your code in your test case has the same order. So you change that until your test passes on your code, and then you submit to Autolab and it says fail the correct solution. Because my correct solution isn't returning the values, the cities in that same order, and then you're gonna get, uh, you get that fail the correct solution, and you're trying to figure out what's going on there. It's because if you're using equal equal like that, 
is because I'm returning a correct answer, but in a different order than your test case is expecting. So you have to be able to accept that as a correct solution, any correct solution. If this is your correct solution, one, two, three, those values, and they can appear in any order, you need to accept one, three, two, you need to accept two, three, one, two, one, three, three, one, two, and three, two, one. There's six different solutions that you have to accept. All as correct, they're all correct solutions. So if you're just checking for one, two, three, and that's it, there's five correct solutions that you're rejecting and saying that fails my test, even though you should be passing it. So if you're seeing that for test three, that's what's most likely what's going on there. If you're failing a correct solution, make sure you're accepting every order of the returned list. No matter what order my correct solution returns those things in, uh, you should be accepting every order. Quick and dirty way to do this. This is my favorite way to do it. <clears throat> Just sort both lists. Dot sorted is going to return a list containing the same values but in sorted order in Scala. Sort both lists and compare the sorted lists for equality. Now, no matter what order either, either of these lists were in, if they contain the same exact values, they're going to be the same list in the same order. So if we sort these, no matter which of those six correct solutions we have, we call dot sorted on it, and if it contains one, two, three, it's going to be one, two, three in order. Compare that to our test case, our expected uh, output in our test case. One, two, three, sort that too, just to make sure we didn't uh, mix up our order. And now we're accepting all six of those solutions. Just by slapping a dot sorted on each list, done. That's all we need to do. <coughs> there are a lot of other ways to solve this. If you want to do this another way, or if you already <laughs> did test three and you did it another way, that's fine. Um, but for my money, I like this. Dot sorted, super simple. Not much to think about, just sort them both and call it a day. All right, any questions on these? That's, uh, that's it before I want to jump to IntelliJ. So any questions? I'll catch up on chat. Can we have map inside a map? Sure can. Uh, and when we're checking for equality on these, this will be a recur. Oh, we don't know the word recursive yet. Uh, but it will go <laughs> into, uh, this will call equal, equal on each element pairwise. Equal, equal on this, equal, equal on this, equal, equal on this. So if these are lists of lists, it'll just be, okay, equal, equal on these lists, equal, equal on these. That'll go pairwise into those lists and call equal, equal on each of those. So same if you have a map with maps inside of it. It'll go deep into all these nested data structures and make sure it's equality all the way down. Yeah. Uh, for testing the maps in the list, for some of the countries, they have a lot of values for it. So um, for testing it, I would have to manually put in, like, there's a lot of cities. And yeah, so for testing, there's some countries with lots of cities. Yeah, right? cities and numbers. A lot of map, a lot of map values. Yes. Uh, so, so the easiest way to handle that is pick cities with just okay. uh, or pick countries with just a few cities uh, so for really thorough test case cases you would want at least one city with tons of uh, one country with tons of cities but let's not get crazy with it you know uh, just scroll through the file to find those cities that don't have I keep saying cities first those countries that don't have a lot of cities and there's actually one I promised uh, a bunch of people I would spoil this one today, so let's do that while well, I'm thinking of it. In task, in task three, there's an incorrect solution that's, uh, and by the way, throughout the semester, we'll, uh, Paul and I will both be leaking test cases during class to help you out with the test cases. Uh, there's one that says, accepts equal, I forget the exact phrasing, but accepts equal to average. So if you have uh, above average cities, you should be giving exactly the above average cities. That incorrect solution, accepts equal to average, I believe is what it was, how it was phrased, is even if a city is exactly equal to the average population, 
then it's going to be accepted as above average. It's not above average, it's exactly average though. Uh, so that shouldn't be included. This is a really tough test, uh, a very tricky situation to try to write a test case for, but it's an important one. You need greater than there instead of greater than or equal. Somebody could make that mistake and you wanna make sure code that makes that mistake is not accepted as correct. So we need a country that has a city that is exactly the population of the average population of that country, which can be a tough test case to find in this file, right? That's a tough one to find. So I wanna leak that one. There's a very specific situation. I'll give you the first example, which I always miss this one. Paul had to point this one out to me. I have one that's way further down in the file. Because that I, this I looks a lot like those lowercase l's. But here, AI is a, the, the code for a country. You have to find the country name, of course. This is a country that has just one city. If there's only one city in the country, wouldn't that city have exactly the average population of cities in that country? I think it would. So this country, the valley, has a population of 1379, which is exactly the average population of, country, of cities in this country. So there's your test case. There's a country with one city. That's going to expose that bug and make sure you have strictly greater than instead of greater than or equal. Get the above average cities, not the exactly average cities. And for your other test cases, yeah, it is, you know, a decent amount of scrolling through this file. Like AM, there's a lot of cities there. I don't want to code all that in my test case. Uh, look like a few smaller ones here. AO, I know that's quite a bit. AN, AN, not too many. Uh, but yeah, some of it is just manually scrolling through your data. And whenever you're working with data, this is just generally good advice. Uh, get your hands dirty in the data. Like get in there and see, get a feel for what this data actually is. Uh, so going through these test cases kind of forces you to get familiar with the data and get a good idea of what it, what's in here. Oh, my goodness. Like uh, SB, this one doesn't look too bad. Just a handful of cities. That's a good country for test cases. SB, uh, seven, is it? Seven cities you got to code up? Not too bad. I would use that as a test case. And then thinking of your, your different scenarios, getting a country with just one above average city, getting a country with multiple above average cities, getting a country that only has one city like we just talked about, get that nice variety of test cases to hit any mistake that a programmer could make. Get rid of all those incorrect solutions in Autolab. Yeah, Scala does have a set. There, there's a data structure literally called set, Jason. Uh, we, I, I use it in LO4 just in one example. Other than that, we don't talk about it. I might even remove it from that example. It just comes and goes um, really quick. Uh, but if you, I, I, I guess I see where you're going with that. In your test cases, if you're testing two lists, if you want to take all the values and jam them into two sets and then check for the equality of those sets, um, actually, that wouldn't work. Never mind. Don't do that. Uh, sets don't allow duplicates, so you won't be able to check for duplicates. Um, th that would you would get away with it for the current homework, but not in general. It's equal equal comparing maps and lists. Is this only in the context of unit testing in the assert method, or is it generally usable? Generally usable. Uh, so that's just a Boolean expression. Assert is just taking that Boolean expression. That's just general. Equal, equal for lists and maps all the time. If you want to put that in a conditional, go for it. I see Nicholas is answering questions in here. I'm guessing a lot of this is... Uh, 
Uh, would Scala say integer and double are equal? One equal equal 1.0? Uh, I believe it would. But I don't know. So let's do that as our first example. Uh, one is an integer equal equal 1.0 is a double. I want to say it'll be true, but I don't know. Let's just run it. We'll let that compile. <coughs> it should be true because it should convert the int to a double and then use equal equal. 1.0 can be represented exactly in a double, so we don't have truncation errors. So we're good on that. We passed. Okay, let's get into some live coding. So I want to write two methods. Hopefully we get to both of them today. Uh, if we don't, I at least want to talk about the testing. This is a unit testing lecture still. I want to talk about testing these things. So I want to write a method named histogram. It's going to take in a list of integers and return a map of integers to integers, which is going to be the histogram for those values. So for example, if my input is 1, 4, 2, 2, 3, 1, I want an output that's going to say there were two ones, there are two twos, there's one three, and there's one four. Uh, so that's what I want to build. And I'm going to start with the test cases. This is something I encourage you to start doing as you're writing test cases. I know there's a tendency to I know there's a tendency to write your test cases after you write the code. I, I'm going to do my best in this class to encourage you, including with the Autolab output, doing your test first and then checking your code uh, is one way. Uh, but I'm going to encourage you to write your tests first. If you write your tests first, when you write your code, you can run your test suite against your code, and it can help you write your code. Because you can run your test suite, see exactly what went wrong or what went right, and then whatever test cases failed, you can fix your code. You can update as you're going. It also forces you to fully understand what is being asked in the objective. So if you have the, uh, a task above average cities, and you have to write your test cases first, it forces you to read through the text of the task and find out exactly what's being asked. What's the input-output behavior that we expect? Code it up in your test cases. And now what, by the time you go to write your code, you have a firm understanding of what that code is supposed to do, uh, where, as opposed to I see very, uh, a lot of students, pretty common, to jump into the code with like a half <clears throat> understanding of what's being asked. And then they just try to kind of plow through it and figure it out as they go. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to stop you if that's the way you want to do things. But if you write your test cases first, I'm forcing you to write test cases anyway. Write your test cases first, and it'll save you time writing your code. You'll be able to write your code faster. So let's write test cases for this. For test cases, I like to use a map. Test cases. And I'll try to... Try to make that make sense. So I'm going to do my test cases, which are going to be input output behavior. The input is a list of ints. The output is a map of ints to ints. So I'm going to do map. And this is where we're actually going to see nested data structures here. List, a map of lists of ints to map of int to int equals a map. And if you don't want to set it up like this, if that's too much, having a map of lists of ints to maps to ints to ints, if that's too much, uh, you don't have to set it like this. You could hard code each test case individually. Uh, that's perfectly acceptable, too. And I'm going to have my input test cases. So say I have a list 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. If that's the input, I would expect 1 map to 2, 2 map to 3. 2, 3, map to 1, and 4, map to 1. That would be my expected histogram if that's my input list. So, and this is forcing me, as I write my test cases, what's the expected behavior? If I have this input, what exactly should my code do? What should it output in the end? So the histogram, I have two 1s, two 2s, 1, 3, and 1, 4 in this input list. All right, what do we like for 
another test case. Are we happy with this testing? Are we done? Hopefully nobody says yes to that. So now our mission is to, actually let me set up the rest of this. Our mission is to set up some test cases and then four input expected output in my test cases I'm going to call numbers again I'm not that creative uh, histogram call the method on my input and I'm going to check to make sure that whatever my method outputted this is going to return a map of ints to ints and make sure whatever that outputted is equal to my expected output. And I could add hint text here. I'm not going to, uh, I mean, I might as well. I might as well at least print out the input. So if this fails, I'll print out the input so I can know which test case I failed on. And then from there, I can give, print out more information or run the debugger if I want to after that. So this loop is going to iterate over my test cases. It's going to call my method with this <coughs> input and expect this output and run all of my test cases. So once we have all the setup for our test case, and I like to do the setup first and then think of test cases, our goal is just to think up any test cases that will expose bugs in this code. So let's uh, come up with a few. Let's try one with only singletons. There are only one of each of these values. One maps to one, two maps to one, three maps to one, like that test case. Let's try one where there's one value, I don't know, one value that's really popular. Make sure we're good on that. One, two, three, four, five, six. <coughs> What else do we want to test? Help me out. Negative numbers. What's that? Negative numbers. Negative numbers. Let's do negative numbers. Uh, I'm going to borrow this test case and just make a few of these threes negative. Let's make the one negative, too. So it should be negative one, three. I left three in my threes positive. And then negative three should map to three. Let's try just a single value. That should probably be a, one of our first test cases we write, actually. While we're thinking of negative numbers, let's try a very large negative number. And this one's really nice, too, because we have negative and positive of the same value. So I'm liking that. That's something somebody could make a mistake if they're accidentally absolute valuing something for some reason. Uh, we'll expose that. Let's even do that again. Let's make sure we have a test case that contains zero. Zero could be a case that people mess up. It's very possible. Um, and negative 100. So 1,000 maps to 1, negative 1,000 maps to 2, zero maps to 1. And while I'm thinking of zero, this is how I write my test case usually. Just whatever I think of, just... Write anything you think of. More test cases never hurts. Uh, so what if I only have zero? Let's try that one. And there's one big test case that we're missing. There's one really big thing that I want to make sure I get. Yes? Empty list. An empty list. So this is what we're calling our edge cases from last lecture. We have a case that behaves differently than any other case. An empty list should return an empty map. That's a test case I want to make sure I have in here. That's an edge case that's going to expose some very specific bugs. What happens when you give this thing the empty list? According to the problem definition, it's going to return a histogram with that. Well, the histogram is just not going to have any key value pairs. It should be the empty map. I'd, I want to make sure I have that one in there. Uh, and anything else that we should be testing? Doubles. I'm, I'm feeling like we're doubles. What was that? Yes. 
Uh, so since the method, it's a good point. Uh, since the method takes a list of ints, we're not going to have to deal with doubles. So we're going to be okay on that front. Uh, if this did take a list of doubles, then actually we want to check all kinds of things. We want to check uh, 0, 0.0, 0, 0.0001. There are all kinds of doubles that we want to check. Since this takes a list of ints, we're going to get away with this. Oh, crap. I don't know how to... Oh, I can do this. I got to go back to... <laughs> I'm in presentation mode, so it's tough to navigate. It takes away all my navigation, but here we go. Um, so I'm feeling OK about this test suite. Like, this is going to take care of anything I would put in Autolab. Uh, but is there anything else someone can think of? I went to a different file, didn't I? Yep. I just got to exit presentation mode quick. <coughs> There we go. Uh, so I'm okay with this. Uh, is there anything else anybody would like added to this? I feel bad that I didn't use it. I think we could. I mean, can we? Now that I think about it, maybe this is what you meant. And check to make sure that that double will be converted to an int. And then that should be 0 to 1. Maybe that is what you meant. Yes? Um, line number 15, I think we missed the negative 100. Negative 100. Ooh, thank you. Good catch. Good. All right. Now let's run this test suite. And it fails. Of course it does. Oh. Have a comma Oh, I mean, it, it's supposed to fail because our code, we didn't write any code yet. At the end of the list, the last one you have. Right here. Yeah. Skyla actually does allow that. We would get away with that one. Um, but yeah, I, I like to have things cleaned up, so I don't want that there. Why is there a map 1,000 to 1 instead of 1,000 to 0? In this one? Well, there's one 1,000 in the initial data, so our histogram is one 1,000. Uh, will the last one fail to compile? Actually, yeah, I, I want to clean this one up. Uh, what, this, what I assume Scala is going to do is see that this is a double, but it's supposed, it has to be a list of ints, so it's going to truncate this down to zero. Uh, before even calling our code. Uh, to avoid some confusion, I do want to actually get rid of that one. Uh, but I believe it would. Line under it because you put map 1,000 to 1 and later you put 0 to 1. So I have 1,000 to 1 and then later I put 0 to 1. It, that'll be fine. So each one of these is a completely separate test case. Like this test case is 100% separate from this one. Unless I'm missing something. I might be missing something. Uh, but if I am, we'll, we'll catch it at some point. So I run this. Oh, that was a compilation error. Yeah, never mind. I didn't even read the error. I just assumed the test was failing. So that was a compilation error. I was wrong on that. It happens. It happens. All right, there, there's our output I was expecting. So on the input list of 1, 2, 3, I was expecting this, and we got empty map because I didn't write any code yet. So let's fix this. And we notice... I'm going to fail all of these except our last edge case here. I'm going to fail all of them. But notice how our feedback did not fail us on this one. We would expect the very first one to be the one that we fail. But remember, mats, the order does not matter. So even though I inserted these in a very particular order, 
that's not the order where they're at, how they're actually going to appear in the map. So one of these test cases will be the first one. It just happened to be list of one, two, three. We have very little or no control over that. So don't think that if this is your output, don't assume that you pass this test. You won't get that the same order that you expect in your map. Yes? So if you want to see how you're doing on multiple tests at the same time, you need to write multiple tests. Like you can't just do this all in one test. You need to. Uh, what, uh, so you could put them all in separate tests or one quick and dirty way to do it is just print the inputs. And then you can see which ones, uh, which ones you got through. So only one, two, three was printed. So I know I didn't get through any other test cases. That's my quick and dirty way to get the information. I'm saying if you wanted to see the other tests at the same time. Like if you wanted it, oh, right. Because once one assert fails, that test, it's over. So if you wanted every single test case to run regardless, yeah, you would put them in separate test suites. Or separate tests in the same suite, rather. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, because right here, once one fails, everything just shuts down. It says, I don't need to look any further. One failed, so. All right, so let's get these tests passing. It looks like this is the only example we'll get through today. Live coding always takes longer than I expect. Uh, but let's write histogram. So I'm going to do my same setup. Same setup I like to do for these first few things that we've done in the course. I'm going to set a variable equal to an empty map. I'm going to process all my data in a loop, and then I'm going to return whatever's in that map by the end. So I'm going to create a variable for my map because I have to reassign back to this variable so I can't use a value. I'll call it answer again because why not? It's going to be a map. I don't feel like typing all that, so I'm just going to cut and paste it from my return type. And equals the empty map. This is what I'm eventually going to return. And I want to process all of my data for i in data. And we want to make sure we have to do two different things. I'm going to ask my code one question. I'm going to have my code ask a question anyway. Have I seen this value before? Have I seen this value before? So if my answer contains uh, that key, which is going to be if it's a key in the map. Contains is always going to check the map for that key. So if I've seen this value before, I want to do one thing. So hard to type in, in a lecture. Or it's a new value. Let's start with new value first, because this is a little easier to handle. Answer plus equals, let me not use the shorthand for right now. Uh, answer, just to make it explicit that I'm overwriting the variable. Answer is going to equal the answer plus a new key value pair. If this is the first time I've seen this key value pair, then I've seen it one time. It's not in the map already, so I've seen this for the first time. One time I've seen this. If I've already seen this value before, and here's where a lot of mistakes could be made in the code. This is why we need test cases with many of the same value to make sure this part's handled right. If I've seen this value before, actually, why don't we run this first? So we can see the progress we've made. So we would expect to get the one, two, three passing. We're going to pass one, two, three. But once we hit something with duplicate values, now we're returning one on all of our values. We're not hitting these twos. So it's important that we have a test case with duplicate values. That's one of the big things that we're looking for in something like this. Right in our testing, right in our test cases, duplicate values, a big must. Duplicate values, because that's like half of the code you write is handling those duplicate values. So let's handle that. We could do something like answer 
equals answer plus i to 2. We've seen it before. It's got to be the second time we've seen it, right? This would be a common mistake somebody would make. This would be a good incorrect solution. Doesn't handle uh, frequency higher than 2. Would probably be my hint text. We better have a test that's going to fail that one. We're going to get through quite a few tests until we get to the one where we threw in a bunch of threes. We got more than two of a value, it fails this incorrect solution. What we want to do is pull the answer from the map. How many times have I seen this before? I'm going to add extra parentheses just because I want to make sure everything's processed in the right order and add one to it. However many times I've seen this, go to your histogram. How many times have we seen this value before? I know we've seen it before, and I know I is in the map because I just checked if it's contained in the map, so I don't have to worry about get or else or anything. How many times have I seen it before? However many times I've seen it before, add one to that. Now throw that new key value pair back in the map. Since I is a duplicate key, this is the only value that's going to be associated with that key. The old value is overwritten. And we should get our pretty green check mark. We pass all our tests, confirm that they all ran, everything's good. We're feeling good about this. Uh, I didn't get to the list example, but with lists, it's important to sort them. Oh my goodness, fuck's sake. It's important to sort them. So uh, with that, how do we do this guy? In, Again, I'm going to try not to get these right at the end. Uh, I'll try to get these extra questions in earlier. But since we're right at the end, once you submit, you're free to go. And I'll see you Wednesday.